it's two past and uh, when uh, there Lynn started the, the recording. Uh, are you ready to go, Chris, after some uh, few words of uh, introduction? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yep. Uh, so uh, welcome to this integrated reservoir modeling session. So this uh, presentation is something that Chris uh, has uh, worked with uh, for a while, uh, which relates to reservoir modeling, which falls under our group. Uh, I am currently the chairman of that group, and uh, Chris has been the, I took over from him, which uh, he was the previous chairman. Chris has uh, many years of experience uh, in the industry. Uh, he holds a Professor II uh, position at the university. Uh, and uh, I guess uh, you can say that uh, you, you do everything from field trips uh, and uh, modeling courses and um, yeah. Uh, currently, you're working uh, at uh, Acker BP as a uh, modeling consultant. And I think uh, this is something that you've worked with uh, some people at the university. And uh, this is a proposal from a research project. So I think that's, uh, if you want to add something, Chris, to uh, all the stuff I forgot to mention uh, that you have experience from, please feel free and, and then start the presentation as you see fit. Okay, thank you very much, John. Uh, yes, just, I don't know who's on the list of people, so I really don't know who I know and who I don't know. So I think we should assume that I don't know any of you. Um, but I think the, my, going back to my history, what I would, I want to emphasize a couple of points so people know where I come from and, um, my experience. Uh, in the 1990s, I used to work for Statoil in the research center, and I worked on a tool called Havana, which was a fault modeling tool. And towards the end of the 90s, we uh, developed the Havana tool to start handling structural uncertainties, i.e. the locations of faults, the, the depth of horizons. Um, and uh, this project then developed into <clears throat> um, what what I believe is now Cohiba, in, which is part of the RMS tool. Um, and the, after I left Statoil, I went to work for Shell, and I was work uh, I was working on Petrel. Very shortly after, they introduced the Workflow Manager, which I think most people use it who work with Petrel. And uh, after very shortly after that, I I started it, trying to use it as a uncertainty tool. Um, and so we built uh, multiple realizations of our models, uh, stochastic realizations. And then later on, when I was in Shell, so towards, I don't know, about 2008, nine time, I developed uh, techniques for building scenarios of different models. Um, and uh, on Norman Langer, for example, I would build about 250 scenarios. We'd calculate the volumes, and at that, at that time, I couldn't get the reservoir engineers interested in running 250 simulations. Um, and we, re I repeated that on the uh, on the SNAD field when I was working with Pignig, uh, and there we actually did a history matching exercise. And then in the last couple of years, things like ResX have been have become more widely available. So. Um, <clears throat> uh, it, it's a different approach to what we I'd, I'd been involved in before, um, but it's just to highlight some of, that I've been involved in structural uncertainty or uncertainty modeling uh, over quite a few years now. Okay, but the problem is with structural uncertainty modeling is that it the, there are issues that that we can't handle very well in with the current workflows. Okay, and I wanted to highlight this. We, we've put together a new project. And it's called FlexiGrid. It's been proposed by the University of Stavanger as a research project. Uh, I put it here. It's a new way of handling. Can my mouse work? I can't, I can't see it. Uh... No. It's 
quite can important you, that it does work. If, if you right click on the presentation, Chris, and yeah, no, uh, no, no. Uh, just. I'll, I'll go out to the presentation and try and go in again. I don't know if that works. I think, yeah, I'll see what happens there. I'll try and restart this. So I see my mouse there. Okay, I'll try again into presentation mode. Uh, I can get a, no, it won't work. Okay, I think we'll just have to try and live with it and I will um, point to what we're trying to do. Um, I, may, I may go to non-presentation mode when I when I really need the mouse. That's what, what I'll do. Um, but this project, as I put here, is a new way of handling structural uncertainty in 3D grids. Uh, new is perhaps not the right description. I mean, when we were doing the Havana work, this was this was actually a suggestion. Uh, that the uncertainty is applied to the 3D grid directly and not to the input data. Um, so uh, what this is, this is an attempt to, this project will attempt to overcome some of the issues with building model ensembles, uh, the structural part of it. We're asking funding from the oil industry and uh, the idea is to employ two, two new researchers at the University of Stavanger. Probably uh, one will be a PhD and one will be a postdoc in a, the ideal situation, but it depends on a couple of things as that. So the staff involved, so there's myself, I'm a professor too, uh, so I won't work on this full time. It'll be a kind of a part-time advisory position. Nestor, who is the professor in structural geology at the university, he's very much into computer programming and scripting and this kind of thing. So he's got a very detailed background in, um, in programming. Paul is a recent addition to the University of Stavanger. He's into reservoir simulation and reservoir engineering in general. And then Espen is the fourth member of the team. And Espen works with Segal. Um, and Espen has worked with a lot of plugin development um, and tech development with Segal. Uh, what this is, I will state at the outset. Sigal have no um, financial interest or interest in developing the software afterwards. What they're interested in is that we uh, use their plugin applications and um, we help them create them, help to improve them, and they will give us advice on how to use these these uh, these plugins. <sighs> my uh oops okay there's a delay with my using my arrow okay so um i want to highlight something uh, that's been going on for quite some time on the left we have faces models or uh, property models um <clears throat> back in the 90s we built the industry built a lot of faces models and petrophys really good at doing the uh, reservoir modeling but myself being a structural geologist i would cry out all the time but we don't we don't handle the structural geology very well um so on the right we have the, the structural geology and there's always been a battle between the property model and the structural geology finally in the after the year 2000 we started getting some good structural modeling tools and we were able to include structural aspects into our 3d models um, <clears throat> they, they once we got them in there, they proved to be usually as important, if not more important than the than the than the property models. Um, but what has happened now with this scenario ensemble methods that we've that have been introduced is that these concentrate mostly on the faces or property models, and there's there's a a, a limit a limitation with the structural part of the models. And this is really because the structural models can't handle the uncertainty very well. Um, and this is, I'll, I'll highlight some of these um, issues as we go along. <clears throat> so we've kind of gone full circle again. So the structural model is, is being downplayed. And the idea of this project is to try and overcome these, these issues. So 
what I will do is I will explain the, uh, the structural modeling process. Um, this is quite important to understand what the, the limitations are in uh, building multiple realizations. Uh, I'll discuss the application of structural uncertainty and the, the problems that I believe exist. Uh, I'll then explain the aims of the FlexiGrid project and how we intend to overcome some of these issues. And then I will give a, a, an administration outline of the FlexiGrid project. I'm, I'm going to go back to non-presentation mode. If I do this. So let's let me make this as big as possible and then we can everyone can see. OK, so um, here is a picture of an outcrop and there are three faults in there. I assume everyone can see them. Um, and the point about this slide is I don't re I don't want to make people feel like they're idiots, um, but this is re a really important concept I'm going to point this out. OK, so if we follow a, a horizon, we follow it along, uh, we can carry out, we can follow the horizon right up to the fault and the, the horizon stops exactly at the fault. OK, or to put it another way, the definition of the fault is exactly where all the horizons stop. OK, and what this actually means is that horizons and faults are intrinsically linked. OK, you can't really do one without the other. Uh, but there are a number of software tools that we use, typically seismic interpretation tools, where you can go along and you can interpret your faults and you can interpret your horizons. And they, there's no link between the faults and the horizons. Um, you know, you can interpret your faults and then you could move them and you're allowed to move them even though they're in the wrong place. Um, but this is a very important concept that, that horizons and faults in real life, they are intrinsically linked. So they should always be linked in our software. OK, so what is the structural modeling process? Um, so this is a quick outline of it. Um, what we get as modelers often is the interpreted fault, the fault sticks that come from the seismic data. Uh, the faults are then converted to a fault model. So there's a there's like an intermediate fault uh, representation. And then we build a 3D grid around this fault representation. And the third stage of the fault is the fault is actually displayed or it's a, it's a discordance in the grid. OK, so we go from interpreted faults to a model fault to a grid. Uh, for the horizons, we have a similar kind of three stage process. We start off with a depth surface. Um, we turn this into a modeled horizon. And then the modeled horizon helps to locate the surfaces in the grid. OK, uh, I have this arrow here because there are some bits of soft, some software packages that go straight from the depth surface to the grid. Um, <clears throat> OK. And then if we think about these two processes together, we have the 3D grid, the final result. We have the fault that comes into the grid and we have the horizons that come into the grid. And essentially these two processes are Completely independent. There's no intrinsic link between the two. Um, so uh, we can, I could move this fault, for example, and not do anything to the horizon, or I could move the horizon and not do anything to the fault. And what that would do is would give us a really bad grid. Um, but it's important to understand that the, the, the two are not related generally in most of our software packages. And they only become related once they once we get to the 3D grid. OK, so one of the techniques we use in. Um, con in the fault modeling is and building our grids is uh, a technique which I'm not sure what it's officially called. I call it the cutback method. Um, so we have a fault. We could have a horizon here, which is comes from the seismic interpretation. As you can see, there is not a perfect match like we would see on that photograph. Um, so the software engineers have in introduced a technique. It's been around probably for about 20 years now, and I think it's in most softwares where the area around the area of the horizon close to the fault is deleted 
and then we use the, the, the remainder of the, the horizon and this is projected into the fault. And this gives us our, our fault cutoffs or the, the displacement on the fault. Um, this works quite well in most cases. I call it an 80% solution. Um, so, so it's not a, but it's not a perfect, um, it's not a perfect modeling technique. It doesn't work everywhere and on every fault. And on some faults, it works quite well on one part of the fault and on, and not so well on another part of the fault. So, uh, in this is a technique that's available in Petrel. It used to be available in RMS, but they removed it. Um, so in some cases we may get something like this. So this is a projection of the horizon. This is a projection of the horizon. And we, we look at it and we say, okay, it's not a very good representation. I want to change it. And they use these things called fault lines or their points in this cross section. Uh, the points come from the intersection of the horizon and the fault. And in Petrol, you're allowed to edit these points and they move up and down the fault. Once you've edited the points to the location where you think is the correct location, um, you rerun the horizon modeling and the horizons then in the projection, they also snap to these points. Yeah. So these are quite good at correcting the, the, the areas of the models, the fault models or fault horizon models that are less than perfect. And this, I would say this tends to take our modeling to, from an 80% case to a 95% case, but it does take some effort and there's, there is actual editing to be done of the, the actual model. Okay, so let's have a look at a, uh, a faltered grid and what does a faltered grid contain? Um, the faltered grid, it, rep it represents our horizons here and here. Um, it represents our isochores, okay. Our faults are represented as discrete discontinuities. Discontinuities, yeah, that's probably a better way. So we have one fault here and one fault here. Where two faults join, we can represent the branch lines, where the intersection lines of the two faults. And we can also represent the, the uh, displaced horizon, so the upthrown truncation of the horizon, which we call the fault cutoff line, or the upthrown fault cutoff line, and the downthrown fault cutoff line. And these are well represented. So in here, when we built our grid, we have all the components of the structural model. Um, and if we want to go to an uncertainty case, um, what, what we do at the moment is we go back to those horizons and faults and we, we manipulate those. And really we then have to rebuild the grid every time. Um, and if you're going to do this on, on lots of realizations, uh, there will be a lot of uh, user intervention, maybe is the best way of doing it. And there's quite a lot of, quite a big time sink there to, for every single realization. So what we are proposing is that actually we do the uncertainty modeling once we have a 3D grid built. I'll explain that a little bit further. Okay, so, if we think about structural uncertainty, or what do we mean by structural uncertainty? I think we can break it down into a number of different components. So there's the, the depth of the horizons, okay? This is a well-known um, well industry and analytical technique, you might call it. People have been doing this for 20, 30 years now, I think, of uh, looking at the uncertainty in the depth conversion and the uncertainty in the seismic pick. Um, so we want to be a, we want our horizons to be able to move up and down because of the 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 errors there. Um, in addition, we want our we have isochores. So these are thickness maps that we introduce to the to the model. We want these are uncertain, so we want to be able to change these. Um, we want to be able to change the displacement on our faults. And the other thing, the the I will, sorry, I'll say that these three are generally, I think they would be generally straightforward to you to do in the, in the methods we're proposing. Where the challenge is going to be is in the uncertainty and fault position. I have some ideas on how this can be done and this can be implemented and I'll, I will explain these later, but this is going to be the challenging part, I think. 
Um, so there are some issues with the current modeling techniques uh, that if we use them, then it makes structural uncertainty not as perfect as it could be. OK, um, there is the how we, how we, we manipulate fault surfaces. I'll go through these three. I've got some slides on these. Uh, on the fault or horizon manipulation, because they will be done independent and they need to be done dependent. They need to be dependent or intrinsically linked, as I say. And then there's the horizon modeling around faults becomes unreliable. So issue one, this is the slide I showed before. We have an interpreted fault, a model fault and a grid. So if we were going to, if we are going to change the location of this fault, i.e. move it sideways, 50 meters, 100 meters, whatever the uncertainty is, then when we do that, we then have to go back and rebuild the, the 3D grid, okay? In a tool like Patrol, there's a, you have to link the faults together. So there's, there's some work to be done if that would, some manual work to be done if, if we were gonna do that. Um, then there is the, the, the intrinsic link between horizons and faults. So if we, if we move the fault, it won't get moved on the horizon, okay? Or if we move the horizon, it, the fault won't necessarily get updated with that. So there's an issue there that when, sh, when, when you move the fault, you should move the horizon at the same time so they match. And then the third issue is how we do the modeling around the faults. Um, what I'm showing here is a, um, a cross section through a fault. So the fault is in red, you can just about see that. Then we have two horizons input horizons. There's the blue one here, which is the, the input data, and the, the orange one at the base here. Um, and then what I'm showing in black, this is the modeled horizon coming out of the 3D grid. So what you can see here, I have a near perfect fault displacement model with the horizons around the faults. Okay, so on this picture here, it's the same as before. These are the modeled horizons in black with the red fault. But what I've done is I've raised the, the two input horizons. They've, they've moved up 25 meters in this case, um, maybe a little bit more than a normal movement, but it, the exaggeration shows the problem. Um, and by moving the horizons up, because we have a dipping fault, they no longer meet, they no longer match each other, okay? So when we come to the cutback and the projection in, I can use the fault lines um, and so the new modeled horizons do something like this. And then suddenly because of the fault lines, they bend into the fault. Yeah. Um, so this is undesirable. The only way to get around this, if we want to continue using uh, fault lines is we would have to edit the fault lines either each time or somehow link the fault line edits to the, to the uh, change in the grid, change in the horizon, sorry. Oops. <clears throat> the other way would be to not use the fault lines. Okay. And this is even worse. Um, so what then happens here as we project into the fault, um, you see you get the horizons in the in the 3D grid smeared up along the fault plane. So you get these typical problems that we get around faults. Um, I have to admit I've been running structural models like this for uncertainty models for quite quite a lot of years. And I've suspected this has been a problem, uh, but I've ten tended to ignore it. If we're doing volumetrics with our structural models, this really isn't a problem. But if we're doing reservoir simulation, we really do need a good displacement representation on our faults. And we're not getting that with either of these um, methods at the moment. Okay, so the FlexiGrid project. Uh, what are what are the solution, solutions that we are proposing? <clears throat> so the, I'm going to show you how we're going to intend to solve these problems. Um, and the idea is to generate realistic multi, multi, multiple structural realizations so that they're realistic, they look like real geology. And we can do this um, many times over and without user intervention. Because if we're going to, if we're going to build hundreds of realizations, 
then we can't have the user editing them each one. Um, <clears throat> and the difference here is that all the structural and all the uncertainty modeling takes place on an already constructed 3D grid. And the 3D grid already has its defined faults, it has the seismic horizons, and it has the geological horizons in there. So <clears throat> um, we've seen this before. Um, the, the grid is made, I'll remind you, the grid is made up of horizons, made up of faults, branch lines, and fault cutoff lines. They're already there. Um, but what I do want to spend a couple of minutes on, and that is the 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 um, the data structure of the grid. Okay, <clears throat> and the way a typical grid is 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 uh, formulated, if you're going to save, if you were to save it as a as a data file, is um, there are a series of vertical or sub vertical lines that occur. Like these here, I'll, I'll point to these here, and these are referred to in Eclipse terminology as coord lines. Okay, and these are described by their endpoints, and they have an infinite length vertically. Okay, <clears throat> then the other point to the grids is the the actual corner points. So the corners of each cell lie on these coordinate lines, and it's just the z value of the corner of each one of these cells. Um, that is identified, and that's all you need to to define a grid. When we visualize grids, we visualize these x and y coordinate lines, but they're not actually in the data structure. Those things do not really exist. The only thing that exists are these coordinate lines, the vertical lines, and the corner points. <clears throat> okay, so let's have a look at this structure in a little bit more detail. Um, this is a Z coordinate line here. Um, along that coordinate, coordinate, coordinate line, we have corner points. <clears throat> At this location here, we actually have eight coordinate line, eight corner points, sorry, or yeah, Z corn values as they're called in Eclipse. So there's the bottom of this corner of this cell, the bottom corner of that cell, the top corner of this cell, the top corner of that cell, and then the four corners that come from the, the cells that I've taken away on this side here. Um, in addition to that, when we have faults, okay, then the co the corner points are not at the same location. So on this, on the right hand side of the fault, the corner points are located here, and on the left hand side of the point fault, the points are located here. So we have a a, 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 dis a, a discordance, if you like, between the corner points on one side and the other. And that helps us represent our, represent our faults in a very sharp, discrete manner. OK, so let's think about this picture here for uncertainty. If we're going to edit this to um, account for uncertainty. <clears throat> we want the uncertainty of the depth. So that's a depth conversion. Then that's simply a matter of changing the depth of these uh, corner points. So these can move up and down. Although the Z corn line has stopped here, it it, it actually carries on. So we can move this, this star here anywhere we want vertically, and it will always sit on this Z corn line. Uh, once you change the isocore, then that's just a matter of editing the, the intermediate Z corns in the same kind of way. So we can change the thickness of our, of our different zones. Um, the displacement on the fault, um, Essentially, what we have Z corns, yeah, Z coordinates, Z corns, yeah, that lie on the right hand side of the fault and the set that sit on the left hand side of the fault. If we apply a depth uncertainty on this side of the fault, which is different from this side of the fault, what we'll do is we'll actually change the displacement on this fault. So if we move the red ones up by 10 meters and the blue ones up by five meters, will have increased the displacement of the fault by five meters. So that's technically this this should work in the this should be fairly simple to apply. <clears throat> um, the problem is, is is doing the fault location. So this is the coordinate line. So this is the coordinate line of a fault. And what we need to do there would actually is physically move that coordinate line either to the left or the right, depending on where we want to change the position of the fault. <clears throat> 
So let's think about this fault location, the repositioning, uh, because this is not a simple process. So we have one fault here and one fault here. And let's say we want to move this one to the left and that one to the right. Um, and we want to move that one all the way over here. What you will do with your grid, then you'll really start to screw it up if you just if you simply move that because you move it past the, this row and past that row and we get some all awfully twisted cells in there. So we need something more than just a simple fault movement. So the proposal is this, <clears throat> and it's to work with a kind of an accordion like um, system, if you like. So when we're moving the faulted pillars, then the pillars in between, they also need to move, okay? So if the first one moves, say 100 meters, this one move 50 and this would be 20 and this might be 10. There's a fault moving from the other direction. So, and that would do the opposite. So essentially what we'll do is if we move that fault to the left and that one to the right, then we will squeeze all the cells in between to avoid this overlapping and twisting of the cells. Similarly, the, the cells out, out here will have to stretch to accommodate this fault movement. That sounds okay in 2D. When it comes to doing this in 3D, <clears throat> we have several faults in our grids. Um, so what will happen is this fault here may move in that way, as we put in here. This fault here may move this way. Um, so the actual movement of all these coordinate lines will they will have to move as a kind of accordion, but as a smoothed um, vector displacement, um, which is the component of both faults. OK, and I think this is where we will start to have. Oops, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Start to have issues with um, doing this correctly or doing this in a realistic way. And this will be the challenging part of the research project. But if we can get this to work and we can get the the manipulation of the Z corns to work, I'm fairly confident we'll have a system where we can handle structural uncertainties in a, in a fairly robust, realistic manner. <clears throat> okay, so this is just a summary of what I said on the on the previous slide. I'll skip this. Um, so in summary, uh, what we want to do is we the depth uncertainty, we would do this simply by moving the Z cons up and down. The isocore thickness, again, this will be moving, changing the Z cons of the uh, intermediate horizons. The fault displacement we'll get by applying one uh, uncertainty on this side uh, to one fault block and another uncertainty to the to the adjacent fault block. This will allow the uh, the displacement to apparently change. And then we the challenge is to to allow for changing fault positions. <clears throat> but the the great if we get this this to work, the great thing about it is that it will be um, we should be able to do this in a in a there's no there would be no user intervention and we should be able to generate multiple realizations and keep the realistic uh, fault model setup that we have established in our reference case models. So two slides before I finish on the the FlexiGrid project itself. So it's a proposal. Of Stavanger as a research project. It's a four year project we're aiming for. We want to investigate different methods of handling structural uncertainty in 3D grids. Um, and I've outlined most of them here that I <coughs> that we on some approaches that we will aim to take. Uh, the description is very Petrel centric. Um, there are a few reasons for this, um, but actually I'm convinced the methods will be applicable to other software packages like RMS or GoCAD or, or whatever. <clears throat> um, the aim is to overcome the number of issues building multiple realizations or model ensembles. So if you're using tools like Redex, Resex, then you'll be held to build um, a range of structural models that Resex can easily use. Uh, the deliverables that will come from this, there will be plugins um, and or test software, which will run the techniques developed, and that will be available to the companies. 
Um, we'll come up with a description of the methods we've tested and implemented and some of the, the positives and negatives of each method um, and some of the methods that maybe we failed with. And we'll be holding um, meetings on a regular basis with companies. Uh, companies will be able to have their own input and there'll be publications from the university and that kind of thing. <coughs> um, so we are asking for funding from the oil industry. We're aiming for four sponsors or four sponsoring companies. Um, that would be the ideal. Uh, we'll, we'll set a minimum of two. We really need two companies before we can go ahead with this. Um, the cost per company is 740,000 krona per year, uh, over four, per year over four years. Yeah. Uh, we have a significant flexibility in how these payments can be made. So if you don't want to pay on the 1st of January every year, we can have a discussion about this. There's, we're open to many suggestions on that. Um, the idea is to employ two new researchers at UES. Um, ideally, we'll have one PhD and one postdoc. Um, a postdoc doesn't cost very much more than the PhD student, and the postdoc will be uh, up and running much quicker than a PhD student. Um, and of these two, ideally, one will be a will have a strong geology background, so we can keep things real. Um, and one will have a strong programming background because th there's going to be a lot of script writing and um, working with tools like Python and plugins and, and what whatnot here. And as I've said, we'll, we will get help with from Segal on making sure that we can develop this into something usable. Uh, we have a project proposal which is available through FORCE or through the un uh, university. <clears throat> with force, the best thing is to contact Lynn directly, I think, and then she can send it out to you. Uh, we're open to having to holding further discussions on this if people have questions and we can come and give some individual company presentations if that's necessary to to get more people within the different companies. Uh, if you have more detail, if you want more details, I suggest you contact myself or Nestor at, at UES. OK. I'll hand it back to you, Trond. Thank you, Chris. It was uh, quite interesting. Uh, and you, you say for ensemble models, but I, I guess uh, in a regular uncertainty and optimization workflow, uh, it's, it's just as applicable. Oh, yes, yes, yeah. It's for, I mean, I, th I think we'd be better off saying it's for uncertainty modeling. Um, it's yeah. just that a lot of people, particularly reservoir engineers, they keep saying ensemble, so it's to put it into their uh, language, if you like. Yeah, very good. Uh, this uh, opens for questions. If uh, anyone uh, listening in wants to uh, ask Chris anything about uh, the presentation given, now, now is the time. You can use the raise hand function or just uh, jump in. I do have a question, uh, Chris. Okay. Yes, not surprisingly. <laughs> uh, is this uh, just about scaling or is it a regridding of the current grid? Because when you move all the IJK nodes if, if your resolution is very uh, fine to begin with, and then you, you need to, as you say, on this horse, which you have the picture of. Yeah. And then you, you, you will have to move according in 3D to that vector. Is, is it a regridding process or is it a supposed to be an algorithm just moving the nodes sort of in a manual way, only it's optimized? I think it's the latter. Yes, it's not a regridding because you would keep the same number of columns and rows in your grid and the same number of layers. It's just that you would be squeezing the cells. You'd almost be like distorting your grid that you have. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. Um, you do raise an interesting point there, though, or it reminds me of an interesting point, is that we may have, we may have modeled, say, the channel widths to a certain width and they are already in the grids. If they're already created in the grid, they will actually become squeezed. 
So they may not actually, they may have a different width channel width afterwards. Um, but that's some, that's probably one of these problems we have to address as we go along. Yeah, yeah. I see that uh, Somnia, you have your hand up, please. Uh, yes, uh, I have a question. If you are thinking about uh, faults that you probably don't have in your initial grid or where you don't assume a displacement and want to introduce that, um, would you have to introduce that basically as a, um, a pillar row, speaking in the patrol word, up front um, so that you can introduce a possible displacement around it? Uh, if are you thinking of just putting the fault in as a barrier without a displacement? Uh, well, um, um, <laughs> we are dealing a lot with seismic obscured areas, so we yeah. were putting in extra faults with extra offsets, right? That might not be, have been in your base case grid. So would yes. you have in kind of have as a starting point for for the model um, have? Yeah, fault, I, 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 possible <coughs> fault location in place to introduce an offset. I, I get what you mean. Um, I think. Thanks. <laughs> I think I think the this would apply when the faults are in the grid and you want to keep all those faults in the grid in the grid. If you understand what I mean. Okay. Yes. If you start, if you got ten faults, you want to keep ten faults. And I think what you're talking about is maybe taking some faults in and taking them out. Um, and I think that is, to, in my thinking, I mean, Nestor's challenged me on a lot of these. And my thinking on that is, is that that's perhaps the next step in this whole process as to how we actually, we may have faults that join and we might want to unjoin them or we may want to take the fault out completely or add a new fault. Um, and I think that would be phase two of a project like this. And what I'm really keen to, to do is just get this these techniques working if these things work very quickly, then we'll have time at the end to to have more to do, to come up with the more complex things like you're suggesting. Um, but I would say what you're talking about is actually what the tool Havana was de designed for, or one of the, its features back in the 90s. So maybe a tool like Havana could actually solve your problem from putting them in and taking them out. Thanks. I see that Sharam has got his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chris, for your uh, nice and interesting presentation. My question goes to whether this new approach will uh, impact on the transmissibility of the false calculations because they are basically changing some face-to-face -face grids across the false, or if that is will you think will impact how would we this addressed accordingly? Um. In the in the eclipse transmissibility calculation, I don't think that there would be any changes to that. But where where there will be changes is because, well, that's not quite true. Because if we go for a change in displacement, then we change the area of, of overlap between cells. So eclipse each time would have to recalculate those transmissibilities. Um, but it would have to do that anyway. I think in, in any multi-grid approach using multiple scenarios. Um, but where this this is quite useful is, is for fault seal calculation. If you're using one of these more complex fault seal calculations like SGR or whatever, is we will change the displacement. Therefore, you have to rerun the SGR type calculation and or the fault seal calculation because that's displacement dependent. Um, so if you've got a fault of 20 meters displacement and you change it to 25, that will give you a different F SGR. So you have to you'd have to rerun that. So it allow it will allow you to get a better control on uncertainty and fault seal calculations as well. Thanks. Uh, I I have a question. Uh, one one more question, Chris. Yep. Monopolizing. <laughs> <coughs> Some uh, some perks being the chairman, I hope, <laughs> being allowed two questions. Now, uh, you, you had this cross-section with, with the nodes, with the stars, saying that, yeah. you know, uh, you can, uh, with the thickness and uh, and uh, with moving up and down. So this this plugin, uh, would it then address 
two issues with regards to uncertainty of depth conversion, both the top and the thickness. Yes, I don't see any reason why not. That would be the aim. I mean, I've separated them out, but I think actually we should think of them as a combined uh, I think the way we do it at the moment is we do depth conversion as one uncertainty and then we do ice cores as another. Um, but I think here that I, if if we get it working well, you'd have it in one step. Yeah, you, usually in the, in the traditional patrol way, you have this uh, correct proportional or you have the correct equally. Uh, so, so we could apply something similar in, in, in here or as a fraction or yeah, uh, well, well, the way I'm thinking is that what you you would build your model f through the first time with all the isocores in there, and then what you your uncertainty would be represented by a a property on the 3D grid. Maybe that's the best way of saying it, and it will or multiple properties, and the properties could be the depth and the depth shift that you want to apply the isocore shift that you want to apply and the fault shift you want to apply. So they would be kind of like three properties you'd add to the grid. Then you press a button, it would read that data and bang, it would it would actually move all that in one go. Very good. That's the ideal world. <laughs> yeah, I'm intrigued, absolutely. Anyone else got some uh, questions for Chris? If not, uh, I suggest that we round off, uh, and I'd like to round off with saying that uh, Lynn will put this uh, video out on the um, FORCE webpage. If you think that someone in your company, uh, you, you'd like to bring it forward, uh, please use the video to distribute within uh, your company to, to gather interest. I, I know that this has been uh, a problem for years and years uh, in the industry to to represent this. So I think it's it's a really good initiative. So uh, you can contact Chris obviously or uh, Force or UIS uh, at any time. And then uh, I wish you good luck, Chris, in in uh, securing at least two and hopefully more companies to to join you. Thank you. And thank you all for listening and please get back to me if you've got any questions. Okay. okay. Thanks, Trond. Yep. Bye. Thanks as well. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.